Hi everyone and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I'm your host Jessica King and I just wanted to thank you for joining us today. Did you know that March is National Nutrition Month? Sometimes it can be tough to know what you should and shouldn't be including in your diet according to your lifestyle. Today's speaker, registered dietitian Chris Nixon, will go over 10 healthy eating tips that you can easily incorporate into your diet. Here's a little more info on today's speaker. Chris is a registered dietitian for Kelsey Siebold. She has been with Kelsey since March of 2012, and she practices at the Katie Clinic. Uh, and a little fun fact about her, her favorite part of outpatient nutrition is helping dispel nutrition myths, as well as encouraging patients to make helpful life changes. Lifestyle changes, I'm sorry. Um, don't forget, we'll be taking any questions you have at the end of the webinar. If a question happens to pop up, just type it into your question box, and we will do our best to address it after Chris's presentation. And now I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jessica. All right, so as you look over this list of the 10 healthy eating tips that we'll be going over today, take a mental note of some of the things that you're already doing. Um, maybe you're already drinking a lot of water or trying to limit the amount of sugar that you're eating. Now, as you continue to look over this list, think about one or two areas that you could improve upon. Our first tip to talk about today is fiber. Nutrition studies have shown that eating about 30 grams of fiber a day can help avoid an initial occurrence of colorectal cancer. A high fiber diet has also been shown to decrease the risk of heart disease and stroke as a result of lowering cholesterol, as well as a decreased risk of type 2 diabetes. For those who are already have already been diagnosed as having diabetes, it helps to improve the A1C level and it helps with weight management for everybody as fiber helps to fill us up. Fiber can be found in a number of foods, including fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, such as whole wheat couscous, whole wheat bread, farro, quinoa, sprouted grains, as well as lentils and beans. To help increase the fiber in your diet, if you haven't already, consider making the switch from white bread to whole wheat bread. To determine if a bread is truly a whole wheat or a whole grain bread, which I know a lot of people have questions about, when you get home tonight, flip over your package of bread. If the first word listed on the ingredient list is whole, then you know that you have a whole wheat or a whole grain product. If the first word is anything other than whole, say wheat, you do not have a whole wheat product, so you are not maximizing your fiber. Secondly, consider snacking on berries. A cup of raspberries has eight grams of fiber, which is about twice the amount of fiber found in an average slice of whole grain bread. Blackberries have about seven grams of fiber per cup. If you wanna further increase your ability to make that a filling meal, add some protein, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. You could also consider eating an apple, which has about three to five grams of fiber, depending on the size. Make it a point to include fiber at each meal and at each snack. It's hard to reach that 30 grams a day without making an intentional effort. Next up, we have fish. The general recommendation is to eat about eight ounces of seafood a week. To put things into perspective, if you look at the palm of your hand, if you're a female, or think about the size of a deck of cards or a checkbook, that would be about a three to four ounce portion of protein. This would also be the amount that's found in about, or found in a can, a dry, drained can, excuse me, of tuna, a salmon fillet, or a small trout. Research has linked that oils that are found in the darker types of fish, the omega-3 fatty acids, found in salmon, tuna, mackerel, and herring, to be beneficial for the heart and brain, and it's even been found to lower the risk of cancer. Don't forget that shellfish counts too. So eating oysters, mussels, clams, calamari, or squid will also supply you with omega-3 fatty acids. Try mussels marinara, oyster stew, steamed clams, especially if you're in the Northwest, or pasta with calamari. To include fish in your diet, keep it lean and flavor flavorful. Try broiling, grilling, roasting, or baking your fish instead of frying it. Add herbs and spices rather than sauces or glazes to keep it healthy. Get creative. Try different recipes like salmon patties or muffins, shrimp stir fry, grilled fish tacos, or clams with whole wheat pasta. Or top your salad or sandwich with some fish instead of using chicken. Other sources of omega-3 fatty acids include walnuts, 
ground flaxseed, fish oil, and products that have omega-3s added, such as eggs and margarine. Next up, we have water. The average person should be drinking about six to eight eight ounce glasses of water a day. You might need more than this if you regularly engage in intense exercise, if you sweat a lot, or if you're exposed to high temperatures for a long period of time. The best indicator of hydration status is the color of your urine. If your urine is clear or a light yellow, you know you're probably hydrated. Anything darker than that, you probably need to drink up a little bit more. The great thing about water is it doesn't add extra calories or sugar to your diet when compared to drinks like soda, energy, or sports drinks, or other sweet drinks like sweet tea or lemonade. Some more advantages to drinking water are that it's a thrifty option. You can get it out of your tap so you won't be, you won't be reaching the bottom of your wallet by drinking water. It's convenient. You can fill a reusable water bottle and throw it in your gym bag or keep it on your desk as a reminder to drink on it throughout the day. Water can help you manage your calories. You should drink water before, with, and between your meals to help keep liquid calories to a minimum. This is an easy place to cut back. Plus, water helps to fill you up, so it'll help with your portion sizes. If water is not your first choice, try experimenting with the temperature. Some people prefer ice cold water, whereas others prefer their water at room temperature. For a treat, consider using carbonated water flavored with lemon, lime, or orange juice, or possibly berries or other fruit. Throw in some herbs such as mint or basil, or you could make ice cubes using these things, and as the ice melts, your water will be flavored. Eat a salad before your meal. Some of you might have heard growing up that it takes about 20 minutes to realize that you're full. Recently, it's been discovered that that number is actually between 10 and 30 minutes to realize that you're feeling full. So if you're a fast eater, you can eat quite a bit in that amount of time. However, if you start your meal with a salad, you get a head start on that fiber, which helps you to feel full. To include more salad in your diet, mix it up. Toss in shredded carrots, strawberries, or other fruits or vegetables to make it fun. The more color you include, the better. Try using a source of protein as well. Maybe you'd like to throw in some nuts, seeds, beans, quinoa, low-fat cheese, eggs, lean meat, or even some tofu. Try a different kind of salad at every meal. To keep it healthy, a note of caution on dressings, um, try getting a light dressing so we want to avoid our creamy dressings. Put it on the side and dip your fork into your salad dressing before you take each bite of salad. That way, each bite is flavorful without using as much dressing as you would if you had poured the dressing on the salad. For a homemade option, try mixing half a cup of mustard with a tablespoon of honey. Or if you prefer oil and vinegar, put your oil into a spritzer bottle and just lightly spray your salad greens with the oil. You'll use less again than if you had poured the oil on the salad. Next up, limit the sugar. Sugar truly does have an addictive quality to it. So the more sugar or the more sweetness you're exposed to, the more your body wants. Decreasing sugar can actually increase your energy because it minimizes the highs and lows of your blood sugar. So instead of giving you a sugar rush or a sugar high that you might get short term, it'll help to stabilize your energy. Sugar highs have been, been linked to road rage, and sugar lows can cause people that have diabetes to pass out. To reduce your sugar, consider a smaller portion of a sweet treat. Maybe the next time you go out to eat a meal with your family, you can split the dessert. Or serve yourself on a smaller plate or a smaller dish. Or consider using a single serving package of a sweet. Buy unsweetened or no sugar added foods and drinks such as canned fruit, canned in its own juice, or canned in water, and add more flavor. Try something new like vanilla extract or other spices, such as pumpkin pie spice instead of sugar. Consider eating fruit as a dessert. I've seen recipes for frozen yogurt that have been made exclusively from bananas. And if you know that sugar is going to continue to be something that tempts you, do your best to just keep it out of the house, out of sight, out of mind. Portion control is a huge thing. There's truly no food that you cannot have in your diet 
but the portion size ma means the, the world of difference. Portions at each meal don't necessarily have to be a specific amount, although it does make it easier on your metabolism if you eat a similar portion at each of your meals. The amount of calories that you need is going to vary for every body depending on their height, weight, age, activity level, and body composition. To calculate your calorie intake per day, there are several apps out there that will give you a guide, such as Choose My Plate, My Fitness Pal, or Lose It. People that track their calories or track what they eat and then later reflect on these things have been shown to lose more weight than those people who don't track their food at all. To help with portion sizes, use a smaller plate or cup. It looks like you have more food there than you really do, which is a great little trick to play on yourself. Pay attention to your feelings of hunger. Stop eating when you're satisfied rather than when you're full. If you think about hunger on a scale of one to 10, Let's call one being starving and you would eat anything in sight. And then consider 10 is the feeling that you have after Thanksgiving dinner. As you're eating, try to stop at about a six. You'll continue to fill up a little bit more based on our rule of 10 to 30 minutes of feeling full and you'll be ready to eat again in a few hours. Start by eating half of what's on your plate and then take a break to decide if you wanna eat more or if you're full, remember, the food's not going to run away and it'll always be there later. Consider serving yourself in the kitchen. So serve your plates, make your plates in the kitchen rather than putting the food on the table and having everybody eat from the table. Or use a measuring cup as a serving utensil. For example, a two-third to one cup serving of rice or pasta is a good portion of pasta to spoon out for everybody. One last word on portions. Hopefully, God willing, we will all have our hands with us at all times. So if you take your hands and open them or have them facing you, mentally fill one hand with vegetables. Fill a palm-sized portion with protein and then consider a fist-sized portion of starch. Eat the vegetables and protein first since we know these are the foods that are really going to fill you up and then use the starch size portion or the fist size portion of starch as your final food to fill up on. If you do overeat at a meal, don't beat yourself up, just get back on track at the next meal. Think more about cooking at home instead of eating out. When you're eating at home, you have much more control over what you're eating and what's going into your food. Keep in mind that the average restaurant portion is at least two to three standard servings. Having more food on your plate is going to encourage you to eat more than you would if you had less food on your plate. If you do eat out, try to choose the healthier options such as a baked meat instead of a fried meat. Start with a salad as an appetizer or substitute vegetables on the side. Consider splitting your plate with somebody else at the table, asking if a lunch portion is available, or immediately packing up half of your food when it's brought to the table and taking it home with you to eat later. Again, that smaller portion on the plate will encourage you to eat less. To help you eat at home more, try new fun recipes. Have each person in the house choose one to two recipes to make for the week. Once or twice a week, invite friends or family over to share a meal. Set yourself up for success by preparing the meals in advance for the week. Take advantage of things like crock pots or frozen meals to make meal planning easier. As an added bonus, once you get really good at this and plan ahead, you'll have enough leftovers to use for lunch for the week. Next up, we have fruits and vegetables. More matters. The average person needs between five and 13 servings of fruits and vegetables a day, depending on their age, gender, activity level, and overall health. To help you eat more vegetables, make at least half of your plate fruits and vegetables. Plan meals around the fruits and vegetables rather than around the protein. Think stir fry, pumpkin soup, or let's say you've got some leftover sauteed vegetables, put them to use by adding them to some eggs at breakfast. Stir fruit into your cereal, Greek yogurt, or oatmeal for breakfast, or consider topping pancakes or waffles with fruit in place of syrup. Try to buy fruits and vegetables when they're in season. They're cheaper and they taste better. Make use of farmer's markets. 
or if you've got the space for it, consider growing your own fruits and vegetables at home. Don't forget about frozen or canned fruits and vegetables. As long as the vegetables or fruit is canned in its own juice or without salt, these frozen and canned options are just as good of a bet as your fresh produce and they'll last longer. Snacking. Snacking is something that many of us do. It helps to boost our metabolism as well as keeping portions more manageable once we do sit down to a meal. Snacks should be healthy, such as a handful of nuts, a piece of fruit, or some vegetables with a low-fat dip like hummus or maybe Greek yogurt with some herbs added to it. When you're planning your snack, focus on the protein. Again, this is going to fill you up. So we want some Greek yogurt, string cheese, a hard-boiled egg, nuts, seeds, or maybe some soybeans. A glass of low-fat or fat-free milk could be a good way to drink some of these some of this protein as well. Include a little bit of carbohydrate as this will give you an instant boost of energy. Secondly, try to stay away from the sugar. We talked about those crashes that you'll experience. So swap out your cookies, pastries, and candies for more healthy food options to have on hand. For added convenience, portion these snacks ahead of time, like your Greek yogurt, your nuts, your seeds, so that they're ready to go. Make a fruit smoothie, but don't forget the protein. Lastly, avoid eating while you're engaging in other activities, such as watching TV or driving. You're more likely to eat more as you're distracted. So savor the flavor, enjoy the smell, and appreciate the texture, which will make you a more mindful eater. You'll be more in tune with when you're hungry, when you're full, and you'll get a better handle on portion sizes. Lastly, I hate to refer to foods as good and bad, but some of our fats are better for us than others. So the good fats are going to be the mono and polyunsaturated fats. They help lower our cholesterol and are found in foods such as avocados, olives, nuts, seeds, and our oils in general other than the tropical oils. Bad fats such as trans fats or hydrogenated oils and saturated fats not only wreak havoc on our bad cholesterol, but they also lower our good cholesterol. They're found in your animal products, as well as prepackaged foods such as cake mixes or snack foods. Choosing the leaner meats is going to cut back on the saturated fats and the trans fats that are found in foods. That's why we talk about lean proteins as much as we do. To cut back on bad fats, you want to replace the bad fats with the good fats. So instead of focusing on a particular amount, we just want to substitute the bad fats with the good. Eat omega-3 fats every day. Again, think walnuts, fish oil, and fish, and choose your cooking oils carefully. So again, thinking back on what we've discussed, what are some of the things that you're already doing? Where could you make improvements? Choose the one or two things that you want to change. Focus on them for the next couple of weeks. Then as those changes start to stick and become easier, think, go back and look and consider one or two more things that you would like to change. Remember, lifestyle changes are all about small changes over time. I actually have a question that I want to start us out with. Um, it's about protein shakes. Are they good in the morning and do they help you with weight loss? Protein shakes are definitely a good option for the morning. You want to try to include about 20 to 30 grams of protein at each meal, which would be the amount in a cup of uh, low-fat Greek yogurt, and that will help to fill you up. Um, the only thing I would caution against is that liquid calories don't always fill us up as well as solid food calories do. So if you find that you're getting hungrier sooner with a protein shake, you might want to look for a more solid food source, such as maybe some eggs or Greek yogurt topped with fruit and nuts. All right. Got another question here about sardines. Are those good for you? Yes, they are. Sardines are another great source of the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, then it looks like we've got a question about the best oils to use in salad dressings. 
all of your oils other than the tropical oils. So I'm not talking about coconut oil or palm oil, um, but things like grapeseed oil, flaxseed oil, olive oil, they're all high in those unsaturated fats. So any of those would be good oils to use on salad. One word of caution would be like with the flaxseed oil, it does tend to oxidize quickly, which leads to an increased risk of cancer. So like flaxseed oil, you would want to keep in the refrigerator as opposed to keeping it room temperature. Um, then we've got a question about, is it better to steam vegetables or roast them? Steaming vegetables is going to, um, well, both of those are dry cooking methods, so both of those would be good options. Okay, then I see a question about, is it better to use Splenda when sugar is needed? Um, there's some mixed thought on this, and they're still doing research with it now. The thought is that Splenda and other sugar substitutes, so things like sweet and low, stevia, um, equal, your body, when it sees those foods, recognizes them as sugar, and so it can tend to, your body starts releasing the hormones that it would after I eat. So your body can start to um, crave sweet foods, or in some cases, people have found that they're hungrier when they eat the sugar substitutes than if they don't have any sugar. Um, while you definitely don't have the calories from something like the Splenda, if you find that it's increasing your hunger or increasing your desire for sweets, I would definitely cut back on that. Best case scenario would be just to use the least amount of sweetener of any sort that you can. see a question about um, frozen lean dinners. Some of your frozen lean meals, such as um, like the Lean Cuisine, the Healthy Choice, Smart Ones, those are actually great choices. Um, it helps to make a quick, easy meal. I would say pair it with a vegetable to increase that fiber and make sure that you're feeling full. But as far as the sodium goes, the calories go, they're on a very good level as far as um, general nutritional guidelines go. So that would make a great quick quick fix for a meal. See a question about tomatoes. It says, is it true that tomatoes are bad for people with diabetes? Um, tomatoes do not have much carbohydrate at all. And so tomatoes are treated more like a non-starchy vegetable. Um, think spinach or broccoli or green beans. Tomatoes are definitely safe to eat. They're high in fiber. They have other antioxidants and they're a great food. Okay, I see a question about what is a good way to deal with carb cravings? Um, first off, I would say to make sure that you're filling up on protein and fiber because these foods are going to provide you with a long-term feeling of fullness. You make sure, too, that you're including enough carbohydrates so that you're not totally, um, so that your body's not at a serious detriment or doesn't significantly need those carbohydrates. If you tell yourself, I'm not going to eat any carbs, for example, or I'm never going to eat ice cream ever again, what's the average person probably going to want for the rest of the day? My, my guess is that you're going to want ice cream as long as you're thinking about trying never to eat it again. Um, so fill up on protein, fill up on fiber, make sure you have some sort of a plan in place for your meal planning, and that should help with the carb cravings. Again, if it's something like sugar, the more your body gets, the more it wants. So just trying to reduce your overall consumption of those foods is the best way to decrease those cravings. Okay, there's a question about popcorn. It says, is popcorn a good source of fiber? Popcorn is in fact a whole grain um, and it is a source of fiber as a result. I would pair it with some protein if you were doing popcorn for let's say a snack. So if you were to do a quarter of a cup of, of nuts or seeds or maybe a little sprinkle of um, Parmesan cheese on top, that would help to increase that protein. Okay, there's a good question. Would you suggest exercising more than one hour a day if you need to lose more than 30 pounds of weight? 
Um, the general recommendation for exercise is about 30 minutes of a moderate cardio activity like walking five times a week. Anything in excess of that, there's no upper limit to that exercise. So any excess greater than that is going to further help with losing weight. For weight loss, uh, up to 60 minutes of a moderate activity like walking a day is very beneficial. For weight maintenance, once you've lost that weight, 60 to 90 minutes of exercise a day is what's recommended. Okay, I see a question about herbal teas. Does the water in herbal teas with meals count toward the daily water that you should be drinking? I would say yes, because those herbal teas are low in caffeine, I would count that water intake or that fluid intake towards your water for the day. Okay, now there's a question about um, timing of snacks. So how much time do we wait after eating before we can have a snack? This question or this answer is going to be a little bit different for everybody. Um, on average, I would say trying to eat a snack about every three to five hours or a snack or a meal every three to five hours. Um, if you can go longer than this, you don't have diabetes or you don't have low blood sugar, it's okay to go maybe closer to five to six hours. But if you find that you're getting starting to get hungry, so um, we'll say about a five on that hunger scale at about the three to four hour mark, it's, it's okay to have a snack. I have another question for us. Um, there's a lot of fad diets like juicing and Jenny Craig and all of that. For juicing, is there anything that we need to be aware of before we start doing it? Is it good for us? Should we avoid it? Good question. For juicing, I would say um, you're not going to get the fiber from juicing that you would from eating the whole fruit or vegetable. Um, it's not going to give you a source of protein, which again, I can't stress the importance of getting that protein in. So I would say rather than juicing, it's much better to eat the whole fruit or the whole vegetable um, and to pair it with some protein. I see another question about trans fat. It says trans fats are sometimes unavoidable. What's the maximum amount of trans fat or saturated fat we should look for in one serving? Um, trans fats, you're correct, they do naturally occur in our animal products. Um, anything that actually has trans fat listed on the label, I would avoid. They've lowered the, the amount of saturated fat. If, if a food has less than half a gram of trans fat, um, the food manufacturers are allowed to say that that food is trans fat free. So at that point, if you read through the label and see hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated anywhere in that ingredient list, you know that that food still has trans fat. These products I would try to avoid, um, and they should be being pulled from all of the food supply by, I believe it's 2018. So trans fats I would look for zero as well as not listed in the ingredient list. For saturated fats, anything less than about 20%, if you look at that percent of daily value, um, would be would not be considered high in saturated fat. However, keep in mind that the average person wants to limit their total daily saturated fat to no more than 15 to 20 grams. Okay, I see a question about fish. It says, is eating tilapia just as healthy as eating salmon? Um, both of those are lean sources of protein. However, the tilapia lacks the omega-3 fatty acids that are found in salmon. So I would go with salmon as being a better choice, again, because it's got those omega-3s that the tilapia does not. I think we have time for one last question. And if it was okay, I wanted to ask one. What's a good first step on getting on track of your diet? Can you make an appointment with a family medicine doctor, a nutritionist? What can we do? Good question. I would say start with your family medicine doctor. Um, you could get a referral to come see one of the dietitians here at Kelsey if you'd like more information 
um, about eating healthier, coming up with a meal plan that'll work for you, and and helping to make this a lifestyle change that sticks. All right. Well, y'all just received some great tips on healthy eating to include in your everyday diet, and we hope the information was helpful to you. This concludes our webinar. I want to say a very big thank you to you, Chris, for doing such a great job today. And, of course, thanks to everyone for joining us this month. Be sure to join us next month for our webinar on April 6th, Surviving the Great Outdoors, Four Things to Consider for Allergy Season, featuring allergist Dr. Lyndall Harrison. Don't forget to follow us on social media and join the conversation. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll talk to you all next month.